Thanks for downloading this episode from Teachers Talk Radio. You can find the full schedule and listen back to all our shows at ttradio.org. This show is brought to you in partnership with John Cat Educational, leading publishers of books, directories, educational guides and magazines aimed at schools in the UK and beyond. Enjoy the podcast. This is Teachers Talk Radio and you are listening live. This is Teachers Talk Radio and you are listening to The Late Late Show, coming to you live from the jewel of the Irish Sea. Yala man, I'm Oli Mitchell and I'm delighted to be spending the next hour with you. Text in or call in during the show by downloading the Podbean app, which can be downloaded by clicking the link at ttradio.org. Also, we'd absolutely love you to follow us on at TT Radio Official on both Twitter and Instagram. This is Teachers Talk Radio, and you are listening live. Tune in live at ttradio.org, or to join in the conversation, download the Podbean app and search Teachers Talk Radio. Follow the hashtag TT Radio. Tune in, talk it out with Teachers Talk Radio. Hello there. I did ask Tom if I could spin some hard step drum and bass for an hour. But quite understandably, he said no. So instead, I have another guaranteed floor filler for you tonight, Richard Glegg. Richard is here to talk about what he believes to be the big three principles of curriculum design. Now, if you want to get involved, not only can you uh, follow us at, at TT Radio Official on both Twitter and Instagram, but you can also search and use hashtag TT Radio when you fancy getting the conversation flowing now. I was expecting Richard to be in the call right now. He's clearly having problems getting on. So I'm going to play the news and hopefully in eight minutes we'll be able to get cracking. This show is brought to you in partnership with John Cat Educational, a leading publisher of books, directories, educational guides and magazines specifically aimed at forward thinking schools in the UK and beyond. Have you checked out their latest releases? Don't miss out. Visit johncatbookshop.com to explore their full range of titles and advance your own professional development today. Happy reading. This is Teachers Talk Radio. And this is Teachers Talk Radio News. The Christian Institute website carries a story on the reminder by Minister of State for Schools, Nick Gibb, that schools in England have a duty to remain politically impartial in their teaching and extracurricular activities. The guidance was published last year, but Mr Gibb was responding to MP Miriam Cates' references to a YouGov poll, which appears to reveal that the majority of UK children are being taught political ideology as fact, and he issued the reminder. Ms Cates was referencing a view that children are being taught that they can be born in the wrong body, as well as resources being used in schools which focus on the topic of gender identity. The DfE guidance comes as Scotland attempts to introduce new legislation on gender recognition, which is opposed by Westminster. The guidance states that schools should not under any circumstances work with or use materials produced by external agencies that take extreme political positions. The Varsity website reports on findings by a right-wing think tank that elite universities were more likely to use progressive terminology on their websites. Cambridge tops the table in the Radical Progressive University Guide, although the think tank Civitas does not appear to see this as a positive. Varsity highlights comments reported in the Daily Mail, which warned that half of our universities peddle their woke agenda to students. The think tank generated the findings after exploring university websites and news reports, looking for a series of key phrases including trigger warning, white privilege and anti-racism. Those with high incidences of key phrases were at the top of the table. Varsity acknowledges a view that Cambridge's political culture is to the left of the national one, but also highlights key figures in academia who feature prominently in the conservative press. It's hard to stay away from politics as announcements of strikes continued late last week. The TES reports on the continued deadlock in Scotland, whilst the Evening Standard covers talks between ministers and unions in England after the NEU confirmed strike dates for the coming weeks and months. 
These strikes are set to impact schools in England and Wales, although the BBC further reports on talks in Wales. Its news website reports that teachers and school leaders have been offered a one-off payment by the Welsh Government, similar to that offered to health workers, although unions have already said that the offer is not enough. Scottish media outlets have also carried a story about what it describes as fears about violence in schools. A clip now widely shared on social media shows an altercation between two students and that took place on the same day a male pupil was left unconscious following an assault. Whilst Police Scotland have said it's investigating both incidents, it has sparked debate on the state of behaviour in schools, particularly as such incidents have featured in headlines before. The Scottish Government has previously stated they're investing an additional £15 million this year to enhance capacity to effectively meet the needs of young people and that they were very clear that violence is unacceptable. In further political news, the petition put forward by three men known as the Three Dads Walking will go to Parliament. The men who all lost daughters to suicide want to get suicide prevention on the school curriculum. The petition they set up now has more than 155,000 signatures, which means that it will be discussed in Parliament after previously failing to be heard. Finally, more than 20,000 defibrillators will be sent to almost 18,000 state-funded schools by the end of the academic year. It comes after the government committed to ensuring there was a device in every school last year. The rollout comes after campaigning from the Oliver King Foundation and its founder Mark King, whose son died at 12 from a cardiac arrest while swimming at school. Guidance to support schools has been created, including awareness videos. And Education Secretary Gillian Keegan praised the work of the Oliver King Foundation and described the rollout as a huge milestone. Mr King stated, defibrillators save lives, and that he hoped that families do not have to suffer the heartbreak of unnecessarily losing a child. This is for our Ollie. This has been your Teachers Talk Radio News with Joe Fox. This is Two Minute Tech with Steve Woods, your tech briefing on Teachers Talk Radio. Hello, a while ago I asked you what is your go-to piece of tech? This week I had the pleasure of talking to Ian Kenyon, CEO of Wirral Respite and Alternative Provision, also known as RAP for short. So, Ian, what is your go-to piece of tech in your setting? Thanks, Steve. In our organisation, we are absolutely embedded in sharing our information and our data via the cloud. And there's loads of software out there to do it. And there's a lot of bespoke software for our type of organization, student information management services, uh, the likes of Sims or Arbor or, or, or things like that. But unfortunately, they're all built around big organizations, big schools, uh, schools with up to 1,200 students. Certainly not for schools that have a turnaround of students uh, who are completing courses in 12 weeks and those students who are potentially returning but require new files. We've tried proprietary software, it's very, very expensive. But actually what we've fallen back to is what Google provides. Uh, using G Suite, which is now Google Workplace, we have access to spreadsheets, to um, form filling uh, software for, for data collection, uh, Google Docs, which is, you're very familiar with everything via traditional Microsoft offices. Being able to link Docs uh, and sheets and forms together has been almost transformational for our organization. It's not the cheapest. Uh, I will say the per user price matches uh, what other software like Zoho or, or Microsoft will do, um, but offers a simpler version for us um, and offers us some interactivity that we've never had before. It handles our email, it handles our, our, our student information, so gathering attendance, it handles our finance, uh, so invoicing, um, the, the the way that the suite works, the way that the package works, just works really well for us. But with very little additional investment in time, effort and training, um, Google offers us everything that we need. The final sort of element that, that has been transformational for us is then being able to use proprietary hardware, such as Chromebooks or even Android phones, and the ability for us to then transfer our data and, and to, to be live in the cloud at all times has been uh, a really good thing for our organization. So there you have it, my number one go-to. It's definitely got to be Google Workplace. Thank you, Ian. As always, I'd love to hear what you want to know about tech. 
Do you have a go-to piece of tech? Let us know at TT Radio Official. I'm Steve Woods, and that was Two Minute Tech. Two Minute Tech with Steve Woods. Your tech briefing on Teachers Talk Radio. So I'm so pleased to say that Richard uh, has now joined us. Richard, can you hear me? Uh, yep. Uh, awesome. It's lovely to have you here. Uh, that's really cool. And Tom Rogers is just telling us that he can hear us loud and clear. So that's awesome too. Cool. All right. So Richard, um, we met in spring 2021 at a high school here on the Isle of Man. And I think it's fair to say that in taking on a job as a classroom English teacher in the team where I'm the Key Stage 3 coordinator, that was probably quite a major traverse away from the career path that you'd forged in the UK. Um, so I wonder if you would be really happy to just let our listeners know why I wanted to get you in as my first guest on Teachers Talk Radio. Uh, hi, Ollie. Yeah, uh, good evening. Um, yeah, my name is Richard. Uh, I'm an English teacher. I work on the Isle of Man. Uh, it's a really nice place to work. Um, it's pretty awesome. Uh, before I came uh, to the Isle of Man, I worked. Uh, I was really lucky. I had the opportunity to work at some really cool schools. I worked at a small startup school um, called King Solomon Academy. Um, and then worked uh, for Oasis Community Learning, um, helping to create their centralised English curriculum, uh, which was really exciting. And I got to work with some really, really cool and really interesting people, really, really smart folks. Um, so, yeah, um, that's kind of that's kind of what I was doing beforehand. So lots of experience de- uh, design, creating and designing curriculum. Uh, yeah, yeah, a, a fair, a fair bit. Um, I think, you know, it's always experience that you use to make the next one better the next time. Um, so it's, it's much more a process of just kind of learning from your mistakes and being like, oh, right, how would, how would maybe I do it better next time? Uh, and if you would just share what, like how you're using that expertise at the moment in your current role here on the Isle of Man, or are you getting to use that? Uh, a bit. Yeah. Yeah. A bit. It's, uh, I'd say a lot of that stuff is kind of put on pause at the moment. Uh, that's, that's not really the vibe. Um, so, um, but yeah, slowly, slowly. Brilliant. My daughter's just come in to tell me I'm a bit loud, so I'm just going to drop the levels on the mic a little bit. I'll take it down there and see how that goes. Okay, super. So listeners, towards the end of the show, we'll be sharing your answers to the following question. Uh, Should curriculum design be the responsibility of the few, such as subject leads and their line managers, or should it be in the hands of the many, as in like an entire faculty team? I would like you to text in your responses via the Podbean app, which can be downloaded via ttradio.org. Now, Richard, we're here to drill down on what you think are the big three principles of curriculum design. We're both English teachers, so please, listeners, forgive us if our points of reference start to get a bit precise. And we'll try and be as broad as we possibly can. Remember, you can text in or call in during the show by downloading the Podbean app, which can be downloaded by clicking the link at ttradio.org. And don't forget, we'd absolutely love you to follow us on at TT Radio Official on both Twitter and Instagram and get involved in the conversation using hashtag TT Radio. So picture this, Richard. I'm a subject leader. I wish, with a blank sheet of paper and the heading is curriculum. I've got my enthusiastic ECT deputy sitting next to me, super excited because they've just devoured Gallim Morphy to coherence in one frantic weekend. They're eager. What comes first? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a good question. I mean, like, I think curriculum uh, in the big three, I think you might have stitched, stitched me up a little bit because uh, <laughs> it's... That's, yeah, thanks, mate. Um, I think probably um, I would say just calm yourself down and maybe, uh, uh, would, would we be assuming that you've read it as well, Ollie? Yes, I guess we would. I, I think um, it's just take a deep breath and maybe take a deep dive into two, two, two or more books um, and just to read as much as you can and read as broadly as you can in terms of curriculum. Like There's loads of amazing stuff out there. There's loads of really, really clever people that have have written really useful and really brilliant books um, on curriculum and curriculum design. And I think probably reading those. um, So like if you're talking about like Symbiosis um, by Kat Howard and Claire Claire Hill or the book on curriculum uh, theory by Ruth Ashby, like, um, yeah, get into those, shred those, read them and digest them. Um, And obviously all your classic Christine Council blogs, um, just get in and read as much as you can and kind of make up your own mind. Um, about what what seems important 
um, and kind of get an angle on what, what all of those different people are talking about and, and what they mean uh, when they talk about curriculum before, I, I guess, like massively dipping your toes into anything else. And I think being on the same page as the person that you're, what you're working with, uh, your other curriculum leads in your department um, is really, really important as well. So having that kind of shared narrative where you're not guided necessarily by one book or one person's idea, but uh, but by the much wider kind of teaching community and all of that expert knowledge there um, and use that um, before going forward. So I would go there. Um, so so just, just to ask you about that, do you think there's a kind of um, a danger in becoming too dogmatic and 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 throwing your eggs into all in all into one basket by kind of you know aligning yourself to a specific um thinker or a specific book yeah totally like there's there's lots of ways there's lots of ways to do something there's like you know there's many ways to skin a cat um and lots of people who are you know they're talking about curriculum are you know are all equally valid and have got really really good ideas and a completely different take on things um, often people will be coming from a slightly different subject discipline and maybe have a different take on curriculum how to design it um, i think yeah the danger of becoming dogmatic um yes yeah, it's, it's, it's relatively real right and i think like anything you know if you were doing a, an essay at uni you wouldn't just read you wouldn't read one author and, and set your stool out by what that person says um, it's probably a pretty pretty good idea to read as widely as you can and kind of form your own opinions about about how what yeah what curriculum should look like and what's important which is why I feel a bit of a fool talking about the big three because I really couldn't tell you um, but we'll give it a go this is the second time you've mentioned that in the space of like three minutes I know it was a point of consternation when we came up with this concept for the show that you, I know you said to me how am I going to dis distill curriculum into three 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 big important things you, you found it difficult right yes <laughs> so we've got well, it's, it's also it, it's also like it, it's 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 difficult but it's also quite easy like you could say three quite trite things and they would be um they would they, they would they would be useful well that's the last thing we want to be is trite tonight isn't it really? uh, maybe try it's the wrong word you, yeah it's late at night i'm choosing my words poorly yeah you could <laughs> say you could say you could give three things and they would they would work and they would be great and they would um i just found it hard that's all yeah yeah sure and and i think you know the main thing that i'd like to get out of this really is that people can have a few kind of takeaways so if they if they were practically going into work tomorrow uh, re-energized about their curriculum that they might, might be able to take something away from this to to support that or to, or to fuel that energy um, so we've read our books uh, or we've got our books where else would we go as this first step what else would we do okay I think probably uh, my first step would be to kind of like soak myself um, in my subject community um, I think we talk a lot as our subjects being part of a wider discipline um, and being recontextualized into the classroom and back out of it as, as part of, you know, big, broad parts of society um, and kind of engaging with how, how our, how subjects play out as, as in, in the wider world is really, really important. Um, so I think being a part of like maybe subject associations, researching those subject associations and, and kind of, I think like things like the English association and being a part of something like Nate as an English teacher is really important. So you kind of know um, the conversations that happen around your subject um, are, are, are a bit of a must. Um, then um, kind of, yeah, probably signing up to those, uh, reading their journals, getting the best picture you can from those, having, yeah, just kind of soaking yourself in, right? What's, what, what's, what's the thinking in, in my subject, in my subject discipline? Um, more widely and then what how does that shape my understanding of curriculum what 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 is what, what is being said about curriculum in my subject and kind of what can I learn from those people um, it's probably quite a useful place to start okay so but is, I guess it sounds like you, you're saying that uh, curriculum can be ever evolving like you know in English you know we, we always revert back to the classics don't we um, Shakespeare romantic poetry you know they, they always seem to be the basis of our curriculum but you're suggesting that you need to be kind of you need to be having your finger on the pulse and seeing what the latest things uh, are happening in the exciting schools around you uh not necessarily well i think like 
the, the latest things that are happening. I think like making sure that you understand what's going on and, and how it looks and how it's shaped. I think that's a fair point that you say in terms of like what's what's going on in the schools around you. I think like before we go to schools, it might be, I think like addressing like the wealth of 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 really like kind and benevolent people out there who share loads of their expertise uh, like on Twitter and blogs and and like a lot of the really great stuff that we can learn about curriculum is written by teachers, is written by teachers who like spend a lot of time really thinking hard about those things and writing about them and that that has been like incredibly valuable in sort of like developing curriculum from my perspective um, learning from other professionals and, and, and other people who are teachers is, is just incredible like the stuff that people are talking about and the depth of expertise they have is is really cool loads of those people are on twitter um, and loads of those people have separate blogs where they go into loads of those ideas in way more detail and kind of pulling together the kind of strands of like what's happening in the in the kind of wider subject community and then what's happening um, kind of in that slightly more school focused community is a really is, is probably quite a useful place to start and just like if I want to make a curriculum if I'm starting from scratch which is a huge job like I yeah. want to be able to take as much of that expertise and skills and years and years and years of of, of um, accrued experience that other people have who, who share really really kindly um, and again soak it up and read it and start to think right well well what where what do I think based on what all of these what's being said and what's being talked about and what's being discussed um, and what sh what what all what my subject community is saying shapes a really strong uh, really strong curriculum and kind of once I've got a good understanding of that well that's a great foundation to start thinking about how you might build your own yeah right brilliant um, so Sorry, okay. I just go back to your other point about schools, because I think Yeah, go on. <laughs> um I, I just think um like actually well, firstly, like you there are loads and loads of people who are really, really generous with their time in terms of blogs who turn up and, and they lead stuff at like research ed and things like that. And I think getting in contact like if those people are close by to you, getting in contact with those people, a lot of them are really generous with your time. Talk to them, thrash out ideas with them, go go and watch them, give a talk on curriculum. Um, I remember going to watch a talk uh, by Tom Needham. I think we like people in my department had watched it like maybe twice, maybe three times, third time possibly by accident. But like each one of those times, like was really really useful for us as a department in terms of us all understanding the principles of curriculum and curriculum design. Um, and so, actually, pooling, put like being able to pull that knowledge and share it with your team, um, it, it, it's huge, isn't it? Um, but what I was going to say is like there are loads of really interesting schools out there. Um, and like if you look at like the Mad Progress 8 data uh, that was published just just as we came back to school in September and there, was, there were those 10, 10 schools that loads of people were talking about on Twitter, Twitter, sorry. I'm just like, I'm just totally fascinated by what they're doing. Like what are those schools doing? Um, that is obviously, obviously they're teaching brilliantly. Obviously they've got really strong leadership. But what are they doing like in terms of curriculum? Like, and I think being curious like have a look at those schools websites like i find it totally fascinating like to look at what padding paddington academy is doing what their english curriculum looks like and how that's different from maybe totteridge academy or king solomon academy and like these really fantastic schools that are like completely changing the game like before creating my own i'd really like to know what like these trailblazing schools that get mad progress levels do um and i think that should just be a part of um of curriculum design before we start putting pen to paper and like shooting an email and you know people are warm and people are friendly and if you shoot an email asking to go and uh, observe in a school and ask their head of whatever um, about what they do and, and how they've created amazing curriculum um, I think that's probably time well spent. So reaching out, being willing to reach out, being willing to reach out. Um, so you know, we, we've got we've got someone um, listening in who says, I'm a teacher who um, at our school is currently rewriting our curriculum due to a negative Ofsted report. You know, you talk, you mentioned those um, kind of three schools, um, including King Solomon. I'm asking you to have a photographic memory here, I guess, but from looking at their English curriculum particularly, are you noticing any trends or patterns or connections between those three schools where you can say, right, they're successful because they're all doing this 
or are they all successful in their own right? Uh, I think you'll probably see some similarities. What you'll see is you don't you don't really see the nuts and bolts. You kind of see the outlines of stuff. You, often you see pupil facing things. Um, so often you see content level things, and I think what content is being taught can be quite indicative of what's of of what of what's going on curriculum wise. Um, and you will see that you know consistently like content is is like really really strong. Um, but I think you're never really going to learn too much like unless you you ask. And I think like yeah, you can get some really interesting surface level stuff um, on a on a really English on Englishy level. You'll get some really interesting insights into like well, how do they teach writing? Um, how do they teach vocabulary? How are they talking about writing? How are they talking about vocabulary? How are they talking about how knowledge is structured? I mean, you kind of get an idea of what's going on behind the scenes. So that's, I guess that's why it's so like important to do like a, a little bit of reading around curriculum and how curriculum works. Um, before having a look at that, because then you can start to spot the patterns about, you know, what are people doing and how are they doing it and why are they making the choices that they seem to be making when they sequence their curriculum. And you do see clearly, you know, really well sequenced curriculum based on like really clear progression of certain types of knowledge. Um, and that's kind of that that will be the pattern that you see through all of them, although all of those schools, um, their, their curriculums do look quite different, which, you know, you would imagine. Well, so, so we're kind of getting into the nitty gritty now, I think, because you started to mention kind of a, a sequencing of knowledge and, and things like that. So maybe we, we push on to your second idea uh, in terms of the big three principles of curriculum design. What did you want to talk about second? Because I think there's probably a nice segue from from talking about reaching out to schools to, to get it a bit more precise. Yeah, like, I guess I think it's really important that you know what you want your pupils to know. Um, and that, uh, that that's, that's kind of critical, isn't it? Like, what is it that you want your pupils to do um, or to be able to do at the end of your curriculum? Um, uh, I, I think drilling down into that is, 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 kind, of, is kind of the next thing. And, and I, I think with all of these bits about uh, kind of curriculum and curriculum design, like, it's kind of messy. Um, you can do stuff in like loads of different orders. So like if you're thinking about like, okay, what do I want my pupils to do? Like a quite an in, like quite an obvious way of doing that is like, well, okay, what's going to prepare them for university? Okay, that's 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 that that's that's going to be your your kind of starting point. Like what what um, what does what what do really awesome um, GCSE responses look like in, in in your subject? And having a look at that, or what the really brilliant A level responses looking like look like. And then trying to like kind of isolate those particular skills and work backwards, uh, compartmentalize them, and think about how you would sequence teaching all of those things in particular areas of knowledge. Um, but I think you can probably start at the opposite end and just think about right. Well, if if you want them to be able to do this thing, um, five, six, seven, eight years in the future, um, I think starting at the beginning is like well, what does knowledge look like um, in my subject in my discipline how does knowledge work um, what does substantive knowledge look like in my subject in terms of you know uh, what how is knowledge created as well and then what does disciplinary knowledge look like in my subject um, as well and how is that how is that created um, and thinking really carefully about the substantive knowledge that you want pupils to have what it what what they what they need to know um, and the same um, with their disciplinary knowledge and kind of go from there. Well this show is brought to you in partnership with John Cat Educational, a leading publisher of books, directories, educational guides and magazines specifically aimed at forward thinking schools in the UK and beyond. Have you checked out their latest releases? Don't miss out. Visit johncatbookshop.com to explore their full range of titles and advance your own professional development today. Happy reading. Fod, who the guy who um, was asking about uh, the saying he was writing a new curriculum because of the negative Ofsted report. Oh, right. Yeah, I don't think I really answered um, Paul's question at all. Do you... <laughs> he's here and he's he's the only one here so if you want to share love with him that's all good yeah definitely. <laughs> <laughs> what was paul's question sorry I, like... well, he was just making the point that his school had a negative offset report and so um they were um 
rewriting the curriculum on yeah. the basis of that. Yeah. What subject does so Paul? What subject do you teach? If you're still there, because you may well not be. <laughs> He's, he's entered, and if you want to call him, Paul, we can make this. Um, we, we can yeah, let's have a it. chat. Yeah. Uh, while we're waiting for Paul, maybe he's entered and then gone to make a cup of tea or something. Fair um, dues. Oh, uh, here we go. Uh, he's primary. Give me a couple of minutes, he says. All right, we're get, we're coming on a bit too hot and heavy for Paul at the moment. So, um, when when your connection cut out down there in Port Erin, where uh, the internet might be a bit more. Uh, flaky than it is on the rest of the other man. I was asking you just to, if you maybe would be able to differentiate between substantive knowledge and disciplinary knowledge. Um, yeah, I guess. Yeah, yeah, substantive knowledge. Probably we're talking about the the um, the kind of knowledge claims um, and receive. Uh, yeah, the stuff that we say um, is essential. I'm doing a really bad job of just knowledge job of this, Ollie. <laughs> Like, yeah, the claims and ideas and works put forward. So I'm just like that that we consider to, to be like the substance of the stuff that we teach. So the stuff that we teach to be, I guess, almost fact. Um, whereas disciplinary knowledge, I guess what we're really talking about is, is something um, that is the knowledge of and understanding of how we, uh, the, the subject, um, how we create meaning in the subject um, and how we make understanding in the subject. Again, I'm doing a really bad job of this, Ollie. <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. It's lovely. It's lovely that you're giving up your uh, evening to, to chat. It's really cool. So let's think then about, um, oh, Paul, Paul wants to come in. Shall we invite him in? For sure. <laughs> Here we go. Hello. Hello. Paul. How are you doing? Though? Not too bad. This is the first time I've been on. Yeah, first time, as you can probably tell, that we're doing this as well. So <laughs> I don't know good. what you mean. I don't know what you mean. <laughs> so, so it, interestingly, Paul, like we're on the other man. We don't have Ofsted over here. We have something called school self review. So there's no, there's no um, pressure in that sense. Like, mm -hmm. I, I guess what I'm, I'm quite interested in, you know, how how Ofsted are able to pressure you to shape your curriculum rather than make like maybe you doing it yeah. yourself you know like the nor like the normal way yeah 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 so, <laughs> so was that like a, a specific bit that they gave you in the report that you need yeah to that we out? um we had our Ofsted uh, I've been with the school uh it was two years now and uh, we had our Ofsted in July just gone and the main thing that they pulled out from it was that um, the curriculum lacked, um, I don't know, structure and um, I don't know, a few different things, say creativity and thing that for, you know, stuff like that for argument's sake. And basically what had happened is that uh, before I joined, we had, so that's me, you know, diminished responsibility. I'm only joking. Um, so what had happened is that we actually had um, one bought in curriculum. Um, and I won't say what, I won't say what it was, but um, it's got its fans and it's got its flaws. And it was very, um, it's quite complicated, I felt. Um, and we certainly found out that it was complicated and we maybe were not, implementing it um as well as we could but there were actual flaws in the system according to our Ofsted inspectors so basically our head teacher who um has been in the role just as soon as as long as I have in terms of being a teacher only a couple of years at the school she in she had inherited that scheme um so she was quite willing to scrap the whole thing which she did um basically in september so since then we have been um researching and um consulting with people and things like that and we are at the stage where as subject leaders we are rewriting our curriculum uh as a as a staff together while doing it Brilliant. So do you, is that something that you feel like a relief that you've now got a bit more ownership or would you well, have rather, rather have, have kept the flat pack one? 
Well, there's uh, there's pros and cons. Um, I would say if you don't know a lot about the Mayans or um, <laughs> you don't know um, specific subject knowledge, um, then it's it's a bit of a challenge, mm-hmm. you know. Um, but I think the reason that we're getting starting to get our heads around it. And I think we are go I, I think we're gonna be happy with it or happier with it is the fact that we're doing it together. There's no one kind of left on their own. You know. Um so for example, we've we've had a couple of afternoons recently where we've just been in the library, we've all been doing our own subject, but we've been conferring with the uh with the teachers from each year group. Because we're only a small school, we're only one form entry and only small classes, so we can we can get away with doing that, and we can confer with them about how do you feel about teaching this, how do you feel about doing this, and you know it's not we're chal- we're challenging each other, we're giving the, giving the kids enough challenge, um, but we can also pick out the things that aren't relevant to our kids, you know, particularly, I mean we're we're. I'm I'm from uh, I'm from a town which is really um, deprived, really deprived, and the estate where the school is is really deprived. Lots of social care, everything else, and there's there's lots of things that we can change and come at from a, a different angle, which will interest them more um, and make it more relevant to their actual lives, which is uh, which is important, particularly when you're in areas like we are. Yeah. So do you think that relatability is one of the key important points of any curriculum that it's got to, there's got to be a way in for for the people that you teach? Yeah, God, def- definitely. I mean, you first of all, I mean, I've I've always been of the um of the ilk and taught that if the kid, you know, if you're better at what you enjoy, you know, what's your favorite subject? Oh, why is that? Oh, I'm really good at it. Well, that goes with everyone. It's sort of just human nature, isn't it? Um, and I think if the kids are enjoying it and relating to it as much as possible, then you're more likely to get success out of it rather than just flogging a, a dead horse because it's it was on the scheme, you know. Um, so I think having ownership of it and being able to adapt it for the benefit of our kids is... Is massive, really. It could be a, it could be a huge blessing in disguise. Right. Really and and uh, if I could just roll back to something you said at the start as well about how doing it together has been a really lovely experience. You know, we started the show by posing the question: Should curriculum design be in the hands of the few or the many? You know, mm-hmm. clearly at your school, it's been in the hands of the many. What 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 have been the kind of fringe benefits of of working together in that way? Yeah, well, I mean, as I say, we're a, we're a small we're a small school. We've only got um, hundred and ten kids, I think it is. Um, so we've got like five five teachers, one who's a deputy, and then along with the head teacher. But I think it comes from the top as well because the the head teacher's taken on um, the initial responsibility, and so she's taken some of the subjects and then put down um sort of focuses for each year group and things like that not in masses of detail um but given us a a bit of direction but at the same time she's been open to us sort of discussing it and um thinking about how we can slightly change the direction with some things that you know i mean it's it's a it's a proper um it's a proper discussion between professionals and colleagues. It's not like I've written this, so you've got to follow this. It's very much like, what do you think of this? If you feel as though this is going to be better, let's talk about it. And then we can do that. So your head teachers um, and your management, it comes from the top, doesn't it? And I think we all see that. And now we can feel comfortable changing things with discussion and, making it suit us as teachers as well as the kids really that sounds like that sounds like a really cool and probably quite utopian way of doing it especially coming out of the kind of situation you were describing before 
Um, did you guys, before you started making it, did you have the opportunity to kind of like sit down and, and spend some like really good, I guess, school um, school time, just like reading through stuff on, on curriculum and how you wanted it and how like great primary curriculum is shaped and, and stuff like that before you got into the nitty gritty of it? Yeah, um, I was saying about the, the consultations with some people. Um, we've, we've had a new, um, I always get SIP and SIF mixed up really so our school improvement officer whoever it is um she was one port of call where she's come in um new to the role but then that's been kind of good that we've got a fresh set of set of eyes really um so she's helped us a little bit with maybe some of the direction we can go in and obviously spoken to the head teacher a lot and then one or two uh consultants from uh, for things like geography and history. Mm. Um, and we've we've not taken, I think originally we were going to take their um, approaches and their ideas as gospel and we were just going to run with it. But I think what we've realised is because that initial curriculum that we were doing was um, questioned quite heavily by Ofsted, um, in the report that we've been a little bit more cautious and a little bit more willing to take more ownership of it. We don't want to be blamed. We don't want to be blamed for the kids' curriculum if we've not actually been the ones to devise it, mm. if that makes sense. Why are we getting lambasted by Ofsted if we've just used a scheme which has been recommended to us by other schools? Mm. Can yeah. I just um, ask about that, actually? You know... Do Ofsted have the kind of power where, you know, that that curriculum that you've brought in mm. is, that the, if, is that the death knell for that for that company that curriculum if it gets to come down? <laughs> well, I, <laughs> I think it is for us. It is from our um, subscription, if you like. Um, however, we all know, we all know our um, own experiences of Ofsted can vary um far far more greatly than we ever realized so it's very much who you get and when you get them and what their initial um preconceived ideas of particular things are um i've you know i've heard stories of oh this is school has got ofsted in they're not big fans of this scheme or they're not very big fans of this approach and suddenly that school's then in trouble with their Ofsted report. However, you might get other Ofsted inspectors who are quite keen on a particular mm -hmm. thing. It's, it is an absolute minefield, to be honest. Um, there's still plenty of schools that use it. Um, maybe they implemented it a lot better over a longer period of time. Um, I think as a staff, we just felt it was overly, it was overly complicated. And I think maybe it says a lot about us, I don't know, but this new um, curriculum that we're doing, we're, we're really taking it back down to the bare bones. There's no faff, there's no 20 lines of one objective. You know, it's very much, that's what we're doing. They're the six objectives and that is going to be um, less faff, more quality and, and that is, that's key, I think, because I think the other curriculum that we were using, there was too many, too many objectives, too many um, directions to go in with one particular topic. Um, and it wasn't quality because it was rushed because it was trying to fit in so much in a, say, a six week period. Um, so having a more ownership, we can actually time it better as well mm. which is key which is oh, absolutely massive because time <laughs> god time is so precious yeah. <laughs> isn't it <laughs> um in, interesting though richard because i know you spent quite a lot of your kind of career in england creating curriculum for like your the academy uh, chain that you worked for how, how many schools were you creating curriculum for when you were doing that um, well, it was essential. I mean, it wasn't really designed to just be cut and paste. 
for everybody to use. I think schools picked up when they wanted to use it. Um, some schools really adopted it. I think uh, what what you're saying is 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 really really important though in terms of like whatever curriculum like you pick up if you're picking up a centralized one like you have to you have to make it your own and you have to really invest in it and you have to really like adapt it for your school and your kids and your teachers and and invest in in, in making it work um and you know and that that that's really tricky um because you know it's human nature like you want to, you, 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 it's much easier to invest in something you have created yourself and you know the thinking behind and you know the processes behind. Um, so, so yeah, <laughs> I mean, that centralized curriculum is, is just, it's a really interesting question. I think it can be really cool and really powerful in the sense that it can save teachers planning time. It shifts, like it shifts like teacher workload from creating PowerPoints to thinking about how you're going to deliver content really precisely and how you're going to differentiate lessons. Mm. Um, and that's really, really helpful. And having like a huge bank of support there in terms of how you sequence knowledge and how you sequence progression can be really, really helpful. Um, but that said, you're going to need to change a lot of that based on where you are and who sat in front of you. Um, and so it's a good starting point. Um, and I think, centralized curriculum is done is used really really well when it's used as a starting point and everybody's invested in developing it and making it better and teaching it um really really well and in a way that they feel comfortable with otherwise it can be really tricky like you've described like i think you know whatever whatever curriculum you guys were using i'm guessing like teachers that impacted how teachers felt about the lessons and probably on some level how they felt about teaching it um mm. and you know it was it was it was it was like that because <laughs> we actually we actually met the guy who um who formulated it and we had a whole cpd day and everything else and the we had quite a large um staff turnover um about 18 months two years ago we had a lot of um supply uh, supply staff in who were on sort of short-term contracts and then um people came in people left and everything else so when we came out of that cpd day um sort of half knowing each other and just going with the flow not really questioning things because we'd all just started we kind of, we did kind of look at look at each other in some ways and think and sort of know all of us were thinking do we understand this <laughs> And sometimes that's hard to, um, it's sometimes hard if you're starting off in your new school to question what they had been using mm. or do you know what I mean? It's so we weren't all established to maybe take a stand and say, actually, this curriculum's rubbish. We don't understand it. It's too complicated. Yeah. Um, and equally, like, it's difficult, like, you know, if you, sometimes you, if, if you're introducing a new curriculum, you want like buzz and you want buy-in and you want some real excitement about it. Yeah. And, you know, you can get that with really well done centralized curriculum and you can get that with really great sort of like the curriculum that schools have adapted and, and, and developed themselves. Um, and you need that, right? You need teachers to come away from whatever it is that you're doing thinking, I can't wait to teach this. Like, this is awesome. This is going to change kids' lives. Yeah, that's it. And the thing as well, because... I mean, I I'm I was lucky really because um, our computing scheme and uh, PE I've changed in the last well actually since sept since September and that's they're v very happy with that that's not a problem so I kind of got away with it but also as well um, those two schemes that I'm using are quite for are formatted quite easily for me to adapt to the changes that we're making so myself and one or two others who managed to do that quite easily or in a shorter period of time were helping the ones who had a bit more of a challenge um overall so i was i'd finished computing today and um sent that off and i was helping um our geography leader who had information from consulting and we were sifting through and picking out the best bits um and thinking what would be clear for the children what could be achievable 
um, and we're all willing to help each other, which, I mean, I've, I've been in a few schools and I'm, I'm happy to say that this school is, has got the nicest staff that I've had in my career of, well, God, 15 years now. Um, you won't always get that unless you've got the people to support each other. You can't be off on your own in that kind of uh, environment where you're trying to build a curriculum that you're all keen on and proud of and excited to teach. You all have to, um, you have to back each other up, which is really important, I think. Did you find yourself having to make compromises at all? And, and if so, like, what was the what was the tool with which you used to compromise? Was it, <laughs> you can have this if I can have this, or, or we? Yeah, yeah. Don't give me the Mayans if I can. You know, <laughs> <laughs> stuff like that. Um, there was, there wasn't. There, we were all right actually. We were, we were okay. Uh, I think what we did is we found if we were if we were troubled in any way by what we had to teach. Um, we found a, we found a better way of teaching it. Do you know what I mean? We found a better way of putting it across into the curriculum instead of just saying, oh God, oh, I'll just never do that. It's more like, well, how can I teach this? What kind of specifics, um, can we, can we put in there, which makes it a little bit more targeted, a little bit easier to teach, a little bit more exciting for the children rather than just say, right, you're going to do Egypt or you're going to do this or whatever it is. Um, to try and make it more interesting for us as teachers. Yeah. There's nothing worse, is there, than teaching something that you hate because it, as much as you can, as much as you can try and hide it, you've got, um, you've got that bias towards it, haven't you? You either love it and the kids love it because you do and you're excited when you teach it. Or your bias is, oh, God, I can't believe we're doing this again. And you try your hardest not to put that across, but sometimes it's difficult not to. So the ones that you're more excited about, you tend to, um, the kids tend to be more excited about. Brilliant, Paul. Thank you. We're, we're, we're nearing the end, but I think probably what we can take just before we wrap up, I suppose, is that, you know, what, you, what you're saying there is a good curriculum or good curriculum design requires a, a, a level of um, or the opportunity for to encourage investment on the part of the people who are writing it. And that's a nice takeaway um, alongside some of the stuff Richard had said, like Richard, if I can just summarize kind of what you said, I think one of the major things is about engaging your subject community. And I, I guess that links to Paul's point as well, because that's about engaging the community around you in, in building the curriculum, not just your colleagues, but thinking about, what the children want as well or what the children would engage with. But also one of the big principles you spoke about was like starting at the end and going backwards, that idea of backwards design um, and, and taking that on those two, two key things, engaging your community in, in backwards design. Just before we end, is there anything glaring that you think you'd like to share with the listeners in terms of um, another important principle for curriculum design or maybe we save it for another night. What do you think? Uh, the only thing that I think is really interesting is is what you guys were saying is that actually, um, I think probably engaging as much of your department in kind of like what you're doing and why you're doing it as possible um, is going to be really great for buying and getting them really psyched for teaching it. So the more teachers know, the more knowledge you share with them and the more of the process you share with them and more they're involved in it, um, the more buying you're going to get um, and the more effective your curriculum is going to be in terms of the tour level. Yeah, in terms of it being delivered. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, Paul, you were an unexpected delight. We thank you so much for that. <laughs> you're more, awesome. you're more than welcome. Thank you very much. Thank yeah, thank please you very do. Much, Paul. Have a lovely evening. Yeah, yeah you guys as well. Do, do call in in uh, two weeks, Paul. That'd be awesome. <laughs> Give us a shout, uh, I will. Yeah, <laughs> will do. And uh, Richard, as always, uh, love you, man. And thank you very much for joining us tonight. And I really hope that we can come back together at some point in the future and, and do this again. Thank you, Tom, for the opportunity and sorry for the faff beforehand. And uh, hopefully I'll be back in a fortnight with another big three, which I think is going to be the big three on behaviour management in the classroom. Until then, enjoy your own classrooms and we will see you then. 
This is Teachers Talk Radio, and you are listening live.
You've been listening to Teachers Talk Radio. Tune in live and listen back at ttradio.org. We look forward to hearing from you next time on Teachers Talk Radio.